Welcome to an orientation session for Ground Story pre-launch, uh, pre-public launch for partners and supporters that are interested in being a bit more actively involved in its implementation. Uh, we're looking at stage one of, of a multi-year initiative with confirmed funding from the Ontario Trillium Foundation. Uh, my name is Jessa Aguilo, and I am the founder uh, of Arts Pond et Tondar, which is uh, serving as the founder and lead of this initiative at its current stage. The agenda for today's meeting is to give you a little bit of a personal background on where Ground Story came from, uh, as I'm, I am personally the founder and I'm using uh, Arts Pond as sort of the, the not-for-profit uh, foundation to give it uh, long-term viability. So a little bit about my own personal story. Uh, then we talk about the Collective Impact Framework, which is where the, the funding is coming from, from the Ontario Trillium Foundation. So we'll talk about the background of collective, what basically what is Collective Impact, how does it work, and what are the timelines, roles, and future fundraising that we're going to be doing uh, to support this initiative long term. Uh, the focus of the, the stage one is heavy into research, so we'll talk about the goals and methods of research that we're going to be using, uh, or at least that I'm proposing to be using uh, for this uh, stage one, and then I have uh, some time for any questions you have. So diving into getting into here, uh, I live in Toronto in the Toronto Artscape Triangle Lofts, which in this slide here is this, oops, sorry, apologies, is this uh, middle building here between the two taller ones uh, in the Triangle, uh, Queen West Triangle area between Dufferin and Dovercourt and King and Queen, which has seen a, a very significant uh, revitalization over the last decade or so. In fact, starting back in 2006-07 is when uh, the plan for this Queen West Triangle area, uh, and there's work happening uh, on, on uh, so uh, uh, this is Queen right here. This is Sudbury going parallel to the railway tracks. Uh, Dovercourt is over here, and uh, Dufferin and Gladstone are over at this side. Um, there's uh, quite a bit of work happening on the other side of the railway track, so this is not the only area that's seeing a lot of development, um, but uh, the building that I'm living in is right in this area here. Um, the very significant revitalization uh, in this particular area, which was traditionally a, um, a lot of this building here, 48 at Bell Street, was traditionally a, um, a place for artists' lofts, a lot of the area was not otherwise uh, being utilized very much, some abandoned warehouses. Um, around that time, in 2006, uh, there was a, um, a study of data that was not actually published until 2010, because we're usually a few years behind. Mm -hmm. um, in, in, uh, and that's one of the, the, the problems that we want to try to address, is the lack of timeliness of data. But looking back at when the Queen West Triangle was being developed in 2006 census data, um, Parkdale, which is immediately west of us and West Queen West, where, where I live, had the highest concentration of artists in the Tor greater Toronto area, around six to seven, five and a half to seven percent. Um, also, some of the lowest incomes uh, in Canada. Uh, of artists compared to their respective neighborhoods. So in 2006, uh, the average incomes in Parkdale for artists, per, for professional artists, was $16,400 compared to $28,700 for the overall labor force in, in, the, in that neighborhood. Um, and there were 22,300 uh, artists in the Toronto area around that time with the highest concentration, about 6% 6 being in Parkdale and 5.5% of those artists being in West Queen West. Uh, so back in 2007, this is what my neighborhood looked like, uh, just where they were starting to advertise the, the developments of the West, the West Side Lofts. And by now, uh, it looks quite a bit different, uh, <laughs> significantly different. Uh, and uh, my building is the, is the red brick, the, the one of the few colors in this neighborhood uh, is the red brick area right here. We're on the first three floors. 
Um, there's been um, some challenges with this neighborhood. So the original 48 Abel Street, which exist, was right here, um, housed quite a few artists. In, and yes, it was very run down um, spaces, but they were large open spaces uh, that were suitable to the arts. And uh, there was a lot of protest when uh, this uh, neighborhood was revitalized with Artscape Triangle Lofts being the only retained space exclusive for the arts, which was only 75 units of uh, half or slightly more than half for sale and the other half uh, for rent. And it is subsidized at uh, 25% uh, um, of for the, the, the units that were for sale, 25% of those units, 25% of the value of those units is covered in a second mortgage by, by Art, the Artscape, Toronto Artscape, which is a great deal for me. But uh, the, uh, it's a net loss, as far as I'm aware of, in the history of 48 of Bell Street. It's a net loss in the amount of spaces that are available to the arts. Um, and historically, a lot of these buildings don't really represent the kind of community that was here before. Uh, and there's been a, a significant a challenge in, in the implementation of this revitalization. Um, Urban Core was one of the major developers of our building and several other of these buildings. And unfortunately, before the work was completed, uh, they went bankrupt. And uh, that has resulted in a lot of the ground floor units, uh, which are meant to be commercial spaces, for five years have been empty. Uh, essentially wasted space. Uh, there, some of them are unfinished, uh, as many of the units didn't really get finished in, in good time. Uh, the cities had to take over on, on completion of the, the, the associated streets, and the park has taken much longer than everyone anticipated as well. Uh, so uh, the ripple effects of Urban Core um, uh, going bankrupt has been felt across the city, but in the building that's immediately next door to me, so I'm in this building, this circled building, um, saw uh, its rents double in uh, July of this year when KSV Advisory, which was a... Um, a restructuring company that took over Urban Core's debt and thus owns the debt on this building decided that the fastest way that they could recuperate their debt was to double the rent on the units that were for rent. Uh, I, believe, I don't know the whole history of this building, but uh, at least it was sort of a, a split between uh, for sale and for rent. Uh, the building uh, immediately next door here I know is, is low income. Uh, so that's great, and it's in a nice size building. But what this has done uh, with rents essentially going up to kind of Manhattan level rents to me and my, when I hear three thousand for a one bedroom, that kind of feels like San Diego or uh, San Francisco or Manhattan kind of style rents. When I hear that, uh, it's creating a lot of upward pressure on the other units, maybe not necessarily in my building or in this building, which are man mandated to be low income. At least the, three, the first three floors uh, are supposed to be affordable for artists. Uh, and then this building is, is low income, but it's creating a lot of, I think, upward pressure on the property assessments and what everyone else is trying to do in the other buildings, which is essentially just uh, gentrifying our neighborhood far beyond what anyone would have thought of, all because Urban Core went, went bankrupt. And there, there's news like this uh, with Urban Core uh, uh, having effects across the city. But uh, In the Triangle, the Toronto Star published um, a, a survey doing estimates uh, based on census data of average household incomes in 2006 uh, across the city, but there's a focus on the Triangle uh, area uh, in 2006, and this is sort of what it looks like with the lighter colors being you know, twenty, thirty-five thousand dollars a year for for annual income, and the dark, the darker colors being you know eighty-five to a hundred thousand for. And so there's not many. Uh, there's some near Trinity Bellwoods Park, which isn't surprising. Uh, but there's a lot of low income in and around the Alexandra Park social housing and over into Parkdale, which is why it's, this probably is a, a lot of artists in this neighborhood. But see what happens by 2015, while well, definitely all around Trinity Bellwoods is now in the high income range and Wellington Place no, no different, Alexandra Park is really the only one 
that's left that's in the twenty the twenty thousand dollar range, except for just this one area um, uh, near Duff near uh, Dundas, in Beacon uh, north of Beaconsfield Village. Uh, this is where we're located, uh, immediately south of some of the highest income in the area. And uh, so if we just compare, like this used to be fifty thousand, and now it's in the uh, seventy-five, eighty-five thousand dollar range. So we're seeing a lot of doubling of of household income in this area, which was traditionally low income. Uh, in the same uh, article, uh, they're comparing where all the pressure areas are here in Toronto. So we've got the Queen West uh, all the way over to Ossington. Uh, Leslieville has uh, the same number of gentrifying areas as Queen does. Uh, North uh, St. Jamestown, uh, up on the Danforth, Christie Pitts, and the Junction, which are all, uh, if anyone's following the news, these are all sort of the ones that are making the, the national headlines in terms of change of neighborhood. So I don't think any of this surprises anybody, but this is the data that we have available. Uh, comparing 2006 with 2015. And of course the headlines are all over the place uh, with artists leaving Toronto uh, explicitly with Ron Sexsmith saying, well, I can't afford to live here anymore. Uh, we're seeing music venues in particular being heavily hit with you know, seven uh, something like seven uh, venues lost in the first three months of, of 2017, seeing commercial rents for both housing and for, for studio spaces skyrocketing and people being vacated, uh, storefront theaters in particular uh, that were trying to you know, find an alternative space to work by working out of commercial, commercial spaces on the streets uh, are also having a really hard time finding affordable spaces for, for sharing their work. So collective impact uh, is a model that we're uh, proposing to use uh, to try to solve some of these issues. And I could go, I could talk for hours about uh, uh, all of the effects that we're seeing in the sector, but that's just sort of my personal story. I've been inspired uh, to take on this uh, initiative because of the changes that I've, I've I've been seeing in my neighborhood, but I'm also a contributor because, you know, I, I, I moved in here and bought uh, into the Queen West Triangle and, and I'm contributing as a result to the, the, the massive change that's happened in this sector. So I, I feel both liable and uh, wanting to respond to this issue into the future. Uh, so collective impact uh, brings intentionally funders, businesses, not-for-profits, governments, and impacted people together over a very long term to try, to, and in a very structured and deliberate way, to try to achieve, achieve systemic change in very complex issues, from climate change to food security to poverty to gentrification in our case. There are five uh, preconditions uh, that are considered in this um, framework, which was created by a bunch of uh, 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 two, actually two um, consultants in the United States, uh, uh, created this framework in 2011. It's really nothing new in terms of collaborating intently, but it is a, a new structure to try to formalize uh, this uh, kind of deep collaboration over multi years uh, across um, industries and stakeholders. So that, that part is new. Um, and they, they have identified five preconditions to collective impact to make it to be successful. The first one is a common agenda where the participating organizations are working towards a common set of outcomes uh, and a shared theory of change on how those outcomes are going to be evaluated, so how we know we got there. Uh, shared measurement then are the, the, the simple meaningful measures that can be used to demonstrate that the theory of change has been achieved. Uh, mutually reinforcing activities, essentially, that the partners are working as a team, not independently. They're trying to, well, they agree upon the common agenda and shared measurement so that they can essentially reinforce their activities. Um, so uh, trying to create new kinds of collaborations at a very deep level that weren't happening previously. Uh, continuous communication, where there's routine communications amongst all the partners for the duration. And um, we'll talk about that in a little bit. 
And then backbone support where there's a dedicated uh, team or uh, infrastructure or organization that's facilitating the, the, core, the communication and ensuring that the partners are working as a team and uh, facilitating the shared measurement and so on. And that's the role that Arts Pond is, is proposing to, uh, to do, although we're open to you know, fulfilling another role in the future. So uh, no one other than myself uh, has contributed to this. So this is, a this is my personal proposed theory of change. And the, the, uh, the items here in green are the ones that I think are very flexible. So I've just kind of randomly thrown them out there because this is what the collective impact uh, stage one is going to try to do is determine what is the scope and how will we know we, that is both deliverable and desirable and how will we know we got there. Those those are the things that have not been determined yet. Um, and essentially, if this is a theory of change, the things in green might change. So 80% of artists in the greater Toronto Hamilton area are satisfied by their shelter and spaces of work uh, by 2030 is, is the proposed theory of change that I've come up with. And we can debate that as long as needed until we come up with something that we can all agree upon that, that we're both willing to try to tackle. Uh, and that we think is deliverable uh, and won't cause undue stress uh, as we get closer to the deadline. Uh, 2030 seems like a long ways away, but really it's not. Uh, it's like 15 years. Um, yeah. And 80% sounds really high to me. And I don't even know how if we can even evaluate that right now. I don't think we have any kind of foundation with which to, to, to determine that kind of number. So uh, it may be only, it may only be that 15% is actually a deliverable number. Uh, and that's the purpose of the first year, ultimately, is to research and discover what is a deliverable uh, theory of change over time. So the timelines long term, uh, this, these are the, the timelines that uh, Trillium, in terms of three stages, has created for their collective impact fund. So stage one is defining the impact, uh, and uh, Trillium suggests that's 12 to 18 months. We're looking at 15 months or 16 months as the timeline, uh, and that's $30,000 from the Trillium Foundation, so it's not a lot of money. Uh, stage two is uh, essentially helping organizations and the collective uh, further define the impact and further organize to actually deliver the impact in the final stage. Uh, stage two is suggested to be up to two years at $75,000 a year for two years from the Trillium Foundation. And stage three is suggested to be uh, five years at $500,000 per year uh, from Trillium. Uh, so the total uh, funding from Trillium is two and a half million dollars over essentially a 10 year period, seven to 10 years. Um, and I'm hoping that we can match that with two other major funders uh, for a minimum of, of seven and a half million dollars over the next 10 years. Uh, so a little bit more about stage one and what's going to happen, which I suggest is going to essentially happen starting in uh, starting now uh, or in December until um, February or March, maybe April of 2019. Uh, they'll be cultivating the leadership and advisory committees, who, who's involved, what their roles and responsibilities are, and essentially what is the, what is the governance structure, what is the the common agenda and what is the theory of change that uh, the collective wants to undertake, if we want to undertake it. It's a perfectly valid response from this uh, first year to say, you know what, we can't do it. Uh, this collective, it's, it's the wrong people, it's, it's the wrong problem, or it's too big. Uh, and to, to uh, say to Trillium, we're not going to proceed. That's a perfect, that, I would be sad if that's what happens. Um, but I, I would uh, perfectly uh, accept that as well. Uh, so it's essentially cultivating how we're going to work together. What is our desired framework? Are we going to work only in Toronto and Hamilton? Are we only going to work in a specific neighborhood? What is deliverable? Uh, and how will we uh, try to share our work over time? Uh, I'm suggesting that uh, with Trillium anyway, there's going to be uh, eight convening sessions 
I'd like at, at least two of them each to be in Toronto and Hamilton, if we can agree that Hamilton uh, should be a part of this uh, initiative. And then potentially other ones in North York, Etobicoke, Scarborough, Mississauga, or Oshawa, other areas around the greater Toronto area, because I think they're all implicated in, in this work. And I already have uh, some of the local art services organizations from those regions have already agreed to, to uh, potentially host a session. Uh, so beyond the leadership and advisory committee meetings, um, there is a heavy, heavy research. And essentially the first year is 85% research. Uh, so there'll be an international literature review to help map, uh, map the system and map the landscape. Uh, in terms of the, the challenges of gentrification uh, locally, regionally, uh, provincially, nationally, and internationally, uh, what are the responses to those uh, challenges and uh, what can we learn potentially from, from those? Uh, so there'll be an international re literature review, both uh, academic uh, and more uh, not peer-reviewed, so looking at uh, uh, newspaper articles and so on. Uh, so it will be very cross-disciplinary. Uh, if we, and that's essentially all that we can do with Trillium is the uh, cultivate the leadership advisory committees, uh, do the international literature review, and host two small round tables, one in Toronto and one in Hamilton. Uh, if we get all the additional funding that we're asking for, and I'll get into that in a second, uh, I hope that we can actually present two regional and two provincial roundtables, so four in total, um, and uh, two focus groups and two market research surveys for both general population and uh, the arts industry. So if we get all the extra funding, there'll be uh, up to four roundtables, uh, uh, two focus groups and no, uh, sorry, four focus groups, two in the industry, arts industry and two in the general public and four uh, market research surveys, uh, two general population uh, with one being regional, one being province wide and then two similar in arts industry, one regional and one province wide. So heavy, heavy research if we can get all the funding. Uh, and the ultimate goal of all this research is to establish a very solid evidence, evidence base, not only to get future support, that additional $5 million that I'm looking to, to raise to match Trillium funding, um, but to help direct where this initiative is going to go in the future. Because uh, I think part of the problem has been there's been a lack of data and we don't know where the gaps are and we don't, we don't know what we know and we don't know what we don't know. Um, so if we can spend a few years uh, doing a lot of research, then we will have the evidence base to help direct us where we're actually going to go into the, in the future. Um, so I hope that in the first year we may be able to pressure test some preliminary solutions to get the community feedback. Uh, we'll see how far we get in actually identifying some solutions. Um, and uh, with Trillium, we will have a small pool of funding, and I'll need to get the, about $2,000, so not a lot, uh, but I hope to have significant funding to hire a full-time data scientist or a data architect to help us bring together, manage, and share collected data between all the partners. Um, the partners that have, I've been talking to have, at various stages in their organizational evolution, have done uh, a small or a great deal amount of research. And the problem that we have right now is there's no way to connect them. So I'd like to start looking at uh, creating an evaluation system and an information system that can start connecting our data uh, to a shared goal, only with people's permission, of course. Uh, other parts uh, that are happening um, essentially uh, as a volunteer, but with some Trillium funding and the other funders if they come in, is uh, a community engagement and outreach. So we hope to do, uh, in addition to the roundtables and focus groups, just lots of meetings with uh, individuals that are impacted, most especially, uh, with 
uh, impacted by gentrification to try to help uh, capture the story and advise us in the long run. So just lots of community outreach, lots of meetings. We're not necessarily going to be paid to do this, or I'm not going to be paid to do it, but it's a part of the uh, a very important part, important part of this work. And it will be paid if all the other funding comes in. But uh, there's not a lot of money in the Trillium budget uh, explicitly for this. But I think it's very important. And then the final part of the Trillium funding is a final report with recommendations for stage two. Uh, in terms of specific timelines, this is what has been proposed. Uh, lots of pre-planning research has been going on well since April or May of this year, uh, but we're have been uh, quite deep in it since September. We now have 25 volunteers that responded to a call. Didn't expect we'd get that many, but I'm I'm very pleased uh, to have 25 volunteers. Quite a few. Uh, um, uh, MAs and PhD students, uh, uh, recent graduates that are underemployed and are looking to apply their research skills are helping us go through a, um, a, bi a research bibliography of over 1,400 sources from the last uh, few years that I, I gathered over the summer and into the early fall. Uh, so I have these 25 volunteers that are going to help uh, read them and take notes and help us distill the learnings from them. Uh, I hope to, we're officially essentially launching uh, this research in December, but it's been ongoing for, for some time. Uh, I'd like to do a public launch event and a fundraiser leading up to that public launch event sometime probably in February or March. Uh, it would be nice if the public launch event uh, was, um, a min essentially it's an open house to introduce the, the, the project and all the partners that are supporting it. I'd love to have a mini symposium of some kind where some organizations or, or uh, lead researchers in this area can uh, talk about their perspectives and what's, what uh, they're bringing to the table or what they've learned, and I'd be happy to be one of those. Um, the leadership committee com uh, convenings will be roughly every two months or month and a half uh, throughout the, the first year. Uh, the landscape review is focusing on regional and national uh, sources uh, right now until basically the, the springtime uh, with an international review uh, happening uh, starting in the spring of next year. Just to try to focus the sources uh, locally, regionally, provincially, nationally first and then see what we can uh, take from the international sources uh, later in the initiative. Uh, sometime after the public launch, probably not until May, I'd like to do the, the first focus group uh, and roundtables. Uh, and if we get uh, word of Canada Council in April, we might launch the first survey, uh, the province-wide survey. So we were asking for $100,000 from Canada Council for the Arts. And that's how all the surveys will be funded. And it depends when we get uh, news uh, from Canada Council when those will happen. But I'm hoping they can happen in May. Uh, so then the International Re Literature Review with some uh, preliminary testing in the community based on the roundtable feedback in the, over the summertime. And then uh, the second survey, the second roundtable focus groups uh, in the fall and final reports going out in the, over the winter of, the, of 2019, with the stage one is trying to end in March, at least the Trillium trying to end in March of 2019. So some of the roles uh, that, I, that I think uh, might be possible, uh, there is the leadership committee, which I think is going to be the most uh, conceptually demanding that may not necessarily be the most demanding in terms of time but it is the most uh, strategic uh, role where it is uh, trying to collectively determine what is the scope the direction the structures the common agenda theory of change and other strategic priorities that are going to serve as the foundation for this initiative for the next 10 years and basically saying yes this sector, our community, we're going to go ahead with this, and this is the framework that we're going to propose to use, and then in the next two years, we can refine it further. But uh, that's essentially this role of this leadership committee is to determine the future of this initiative and what, how is it going to be delivered. So I'm suggesting meetings that roughly every six to eight weeks, starting in February of next year, 
so that we'll spend the next couple of months doing some research to help uh, give us some grounded foundation to work with. Uh, and then we'll start meetings in February, meeting roughly every month and a half or two months with uh, communications uh, via electronic means uh, on an as-needed, as-available basis uh, as questions uh, come up from the research. Uh, I mentioned that I'd like to have sessions in both Toronto and Hamilton as the core, but then also extending throughout the GTA. Uh, so maybe four sessions in Toronto and Hamilton, two each, and then one session each in North York, uh, Etobicoke, Scarborough, and Mississauga. The advisory committee is essentially the same role as the leadership committee, but it's without uh, uh, being asked to uh, attend all of these leadership committee sessions. So it's to, to take a look at the documentation and the planning that's coming out of the leadership committee work and providing, providing feedback to ensure it's responsive to the needs of, of the community that you as an advisory committee member uh, live in, but also the wider sector overall. So it's, it's, if you want a much, much more flexible role in terms of timing and scheduling, it's whenever you're available, uh, it's a much more flexible role. Uh, the research committee is going to be, uh, I think, the most busy act, uh, activity, uh, far busier than the leadership committee, uh, because we have, as I say, a very large archive of 1,400 sources that are published now online on Zotero. You can find a link to that uh, resource on the groundstory.ca website. Uh, so there's 1,400 sources uh, that I've gathered from the last two and a half or three years uh, internationally, and I've got another 7,000 or so uh, going back to the 70s. So it's huge, uh, and essentially the role of this committee, if you have some knowledge about some of the literature that's out there, is helping us to identify which ones, which sources need to be looked at in detail, which ones can be looked at more cursor, at a more cursory level, and also potentially contributing uh, other sources to the research, and if you have the time or interest or capacity to, to help in reading some of these sources. Uh, so ultimately, the purpose of this committee is to help ensure the focus of the research is relevant and effective to the needs of the leadership committee uh, as, it, as it meets throughout the initiative. So we may need to make a number of pivots in, in the focus of the research over time as the leadership committee narrows in on the focus of the, of the effort. Um, the advisory, that's not, sorry, I meant to put that, uh, re recruitment committee, my apologies, is to help share essentially community outreach, is to, uh, I didn't change the name there, uh, is to help share knowledge and uh, of the initiative to the community and potentially to help additional partners or most crucially, from my point of view, uh, participants, impacted people, impacted artists, impacted communities um, from very diverse uh, indigenous, francophone, every po possible, uh, deaf, uh, disability, uh, Asian, any possible, new Canadians, any possible diverse community that is uh, is impacted by uh, gentrification, uh, I would like to be involved. So, um, there's going to be a need for, I can't reach everybody, uh, so if you have some interest in uh, connecting us to other people or helping to recruit, recruit their at least awareness of this so we can be as inclusive as possible, this is a key role uh, over time. Um, the next ones are essentially uh, meeting space, uh, although we can often just meet uh, through Skype, uh, but it'd be nice to meet face-to-face -face as often as possible. Uh, if the leadership committee you know, grows to 40 or 100 even, uh, we'll need a much larger space. Uh, for now, the people that have responded is about 25 or 30 that we'd be looking for a potential uh, meeting space. Uh, the roundtable is uh, these public roundtables. I'm looking to host two, uh, maybe four, uh, if we get all the funding, but uh, two public roundtables with uh, thinking we might get 100, maybe maybe if we're really lucky, we might get a lot, as, as many as 250, but I think we probably 100 is a reasonable goal uh, uh, to attend. And these are people to sh uh, impacted people, uh, concerned citizens, and so on, to share their their uh, responses to this uh, to this problem, uh, and then we'll have roundtables round for the arts industry as well. 
but my priority is to have roundtables for the public first. Uh, and the, 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 the internal research that we're doing will, will capture the arts industry. But if we get all the funding, then there will be two uh, arts industry roundtables as well. Uh, the launch event is essentially the fundraising open house uh, mini symposium idea, which I would like to have happen in February or March uh, at the latest of next year, and then a closing report launch event uh, in February or March of 2019 uh, is what the launch event host space is. And then the last committee is fundraising, um, basically to help out with uh, fundraising, special events management, uh, grant writing wherever possible. Uh, on the grant writing, uh, these are the ones that I have applied to or will be applying to. So we did get uh, the Ontario Trillium Foundation. I haven't signed the contract yet, but I'm assuming it's going to be for the full amount at $30,000. Uh, they, they told me, yes, we got the f uh, grant, but I forgot to ask, so how much are we getting? But I assume it's the full amount. Uh, this is a very complex initiative, so I, I can't imagine they wouldn't be giving what we asked for. Uh, we'll also be applying to Canada Council for 100000 to the sector innovation and development, and that's in essence to allow the, uh, the market surveys and focus groups uh, and public roundtables to happen. Uh, we'll, uh, Arts Pond will be uh, applying for Canada Summer Jobs for two positions, a summer uh, communications assistant and a research assistant. Um, we have a partnership, uh, at least before the strike, we have a partnership with Humber College. Uh, I have yet to have a confirmation that it's still a go uh, pending the effects of the strike, um, but I'm assuming it will be a go. Uh, the research analyst and arts management programs at Humber College, which is a postgraduate uh, certificate one-year program, uh, their co-op program will be getting an, a number of students uh, to come and help us with the research and the management, uh, uh, essentially, uh, throughout the summer and fall of, of 2018. So the Canada Summer Jobs is just going to complement that. Uh, we're applying to the Propeller Project at Toronto Pearson, uh, also to help support the, uh, that heavy research focus because that's their interest, is, is around research. And I'm hoping that can become a multi-year relationship, as I, I hope we can get you know, three or four years of uh, the, the Canada Council uh, Strategic uh, Sector Innovation Development Program. Uh, we're having a conversation in early December with Canadian Heritage. I'm hoping we can have also a multi-year relationship with them uh, through the strate Strategic Initiatives Program. I'm uh, approaching them hopefully for $250,000 for the later stages of Stage 1 and the initial uh, first nine months or so of Stage 2, because Stage 2 is two years. Uh, we're applying for essentially 18 months of uh, research funding from strategic initiatives, which would not start happening until October of 2018. Uh, so it goes uh, essentially to 2020, uh, or late, uh, yeah, late, late 2019, early two 2020 uh, from Canadian Heritage. And I hope that that, after uh, demonstrating the, uh, the focus and the desired impact of stage two, that that can become the matching funds of uh, the Ontario Trillium uh, stage three. Uh, we'll probably not get two and a half million from strategic initiatives long term, but one can hope. Uh, Ontario Arts Council art services projects. Uh, we hope to have you know that each year for the next three years, and then we hope Arts Pond can become uh, an operating client. In which case, we can then uh, contribute operating funds uh, to this initiative long term. Uh, we've been talking to the J W McConnell Foundation and the Inuweave Inu Collective Impact Fund, and they're very excited about our initiative and and are eager to, to support it. So uh, we should be able to uh, get uh, some of that startup funding from them as well. We're not quite ready as a collective uh, to, there's a deadline in January of 2018 and July. I don't think as a collective we're ready because uh, it's impl implementation funding as opposed to research, uh, the Inuweave uh, funding. 
So we need to be a little bit further along and determine what our potential uh, shared agenda, common agenda and outcomes and, and theory of change is before they will fund us. So I don't think we can apply until we've done some, some preliminary work in July. And they're, they're waiting for us to apply whenever we're ready. Uh, and I, my, my goal for the fundraising this fall is $7,500. So the research process, uh, the major questions, what, are, what is the role of the arts in gentrification and displacement? What are the public perceptions of artists for the same, for gentrification and displacement? What, how are we contributing or not contributing to both positive and negative uh, ripple effects of gentrification? Uh, there's a re revitalization side. Some people think gentrification is all positive, and then there's the displacement side, where others increasingly are saying it's, it's not positive at all. Uh, what are the, if, if the artists, if arts aren't contributing to gentrification very much, well, what is and how can the arts help? Uh, either as educators to help people get uh, inspired to want to respond to this issue or actually contributing to make uh, community revitalization uh, much more inclusive and more positive. Um, we'll have to determine what this will be. Um, where are Toronto and Hamilton GTHA artists currently living and working? How, how, how badly are they being displaced right now and in the past few years? How quickly is our sector changing? Um, what challenges are they having in access, accessing both affordable shelter and spaces of work? How quickly is our economy changing to a post-capitalist um, society, which I think is, is happening right now very, very quickly with the shift to a gig economy. Um, and is that an implication that is going to ramp up these uh, changes of gentrification and displacement much more quickly than any, any of us can imagine? So it, it, for me, it's both shelter, uh, housing, spaces of work, but also the economy. What's happening to our economy, uh, the cultural economy, and understanding of the importance of the arts? All of these things, I think, are going to be implicated in our questions. Um, what other regions are, are experiencing these challenges, and how are they responding? So I think another big question is, if artists are being displaced, which we think, I think there's definitely evidence that they are, where are they being moved to? And where are they moving to? And are they moving to you know, all kinds of different areas? Are they moving en masse, like there was a few years ago, en masse to Hamilton? Um, are those regions prepared to uh, accept and maximize the potential and respond to the challenges of uh, a mass influx of artists into their municipalities? Uh, what range of tools, possibilities, and interventions are working and not working in response to this issue locally, nationally, internationally? What are the key areas we need to invest for further resources uh, for much deeper research? And what do we know and, and what don't we know about uh, where we need to go? Big questions. Um, for the 25 volunteers that are currently going through the literature review, I've tried to position three key areas for their research uh, and their note taking. Um, I'm not suggesting this is the answer, but you know, I had to come up with something uh, to try to get into something that's narrow and not too overwhelming. Uh, so I've taken three R's, roots, ripples, and responses. Uh, as research questions. So what are the roots, drivers, and causes of gentrification? And we need to determine in what regions we're actually going to focus this on, in on. Uh, is it Davenport area, for example, where I live? Is it Toronto? Is it Hamilton? Is it the whole GTHA? Is it all of Ontario that we eventually may be able to, to respond to? Is it eventually be, uh, become a national effort and, and kind of facetiously can we respond to this issue globally, which it is a global issue? Uh, I don't think we can, but maybe through shared learning, we could attempt to, to do that. But these are questions for me. Uh, what are the roots and drivers in which regions are we trying to focus on? And then essentially, what is the role of the arts in all of this? Uh, there's all kinds of factors that are contributing to uh, gentrification and displacement, social, cultural, economic, political, geographic factors. Uh, how does the, what is the role of the arts in all of these things? The ripples are, what are the positive and not so positive adverse ripple effects of gentrification? 
Obviously, uh, social spatial displacement is one of them. Uh, neighborhood revitalization could be more uh, considered more positive. Uh, loss of affordable housing, not so positive. Loss of cultural spaces, greater income inequality and polarization. Um, some of these are the effects I think we're seeing now. Uh, responses uh, are essentially what are the, the potential solutions to gentrification, but also more broadly, and that's where I would like to focus in this category responses is potential solutions, but also more broadly are just uh, responses to like pr protesting. Uh, we're seeing a lot of art washing uh, protests happening in, uh, in both uh, New York and in California these days. Uh, mitigating or mapping uh, uh, the effects of uh, gentrification maybe aren't necessarily long-term solutions, but help us understand what's going on. So I consider those as responses as well. Uh, pre uh, predicting future gentrification, pr pr trying to preserve neighborhoods is also a potential response. Uh, trying to develop uh, equitable urban development uh, responses, uh, community land trusts, affordable housing, economic incentives for the arts, or other collective impact efforts may all be uh, relevant in terms of trying to find uh, potential learnings uh, in the sector. Uh, just a few highlights from the 1,400 plus uh, sources that I've pulled out so far in my own research. Uh, the Canadian, that I think are interesting or maybe relevant uh, to this work. Uh, the Canadian Centre for Economic Analysis has done a big data machine learning analysis of, I believe it was 100 previously unconnected sources, uh, including um, Statistics Canada and so on, uh, uh, trying to understand the, force, the forces that are driving uh, the lack of affordable housing in the GTHA. Uh, and they've identified 40 correlation, a map, they've created a, a map of 40 correlations uh, between responses and public po or challenges and public policies that are driving shelter unaffordability. Uh, Karen Chappell uh, has done some work to map neighborhood change and gentrification susceptibility in, in, the, uh, in California in San Francisco in particular, uh, and her work is, is quite interesting. Uh, another mapping um, effort is in, the Por in Portland, Oregon, uh, and they're trying to map the, the changes in, in gentrifying neighborhoods in their region. Uh, Denver, Colorado has done a study uh, trying to see what responses have been working and not working to mitigate uh, involuntary displacement uh, internationally and in their regions. Uh, and I haven't had a chance to actually read it, but I've headlined it and it looks quite interesting. Uh, the Urban Institute has also done a case study of efforts to mitigate uh, displacement locally. These aren't arts-focused studies, but I, they could uh, have some potential learnings. Here in Canada, the neighborhood change effort has been going on for, for many years. It's a multi-year research uh, uh, funded by SHRC uh, at U of T. Uh, and they've been doing quite a lot of research around income equality, income polarization, and poverty, and how uh, changes in neighborhoods uh, through development are impacting, uh, impacting poverty. Uh, so there's a, a lot of research there that may be relevant. Uh, oh, Geolum is in, uh, oh, not Har Hartford, <laughs> or I forget, in Texas somewhere. Uh, Hartford, I think, uh, just momentarily I've forgotten where they're located. Um, they're having lots of problems, not with displacement, but more ghettoization uh, due to uh, having economic problems in their area. And they're trying to uh, preserve their culture by mapping where their culture, where their culture um, hotspots are and where they are moving to over time. Um, as they either you know go out of business or move to other neighborhoods, so they're actually just trying to preserve the culture that they have, uh, and they've developed a, a tool, and they have um, they've got some technical guidelines on how they develop their tool for others that want to to try to use it, or develop something similar. There's lots happening in Canada around tax policy, both locally with uh, the charitable tax. Uh, 
uh, proposal for the 401 Richmond and other buildings like it hasn't been implemented, implemented yet, but there's a lot of work that's happening, uh, as well as foreign buyers tax and vacancy uh, property taxes uh, proposed in BC. Uh, but with the turn from Liberal to NDP government, they're looking at uh, changing or revising that uh, out in British Columbia. We don't know where it's going. It hasn't quite uh, delivered what they had hoped. Uh, it did for a short term, but uh, prices started going up again um, within a year. So it hasn't had a long-term impact that they had hoped. Uh, and then globally, there's uh, World Cities Cultural Forum that's doing a lot of work, uh, research, and I found this one resource, The Impact of Artists on Contemporary Urban Development in Europe, that I'm hoping is going to be interesting. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but it looks promising. And uh, Carl Grodash, is, uh, his work, when I came across it um, in end of last year, uh, and it was published in the fall of 2016, essentially convinced me to uh, do this work, uh, to try to go ahead. Um, he's done um, some correlation mapping, not just as the creative industries, as a broad brush, like someone, uh, oh, a creative class, I'm blanking on his name. <laughs> Richard Florida. Yes, Richard Florida, thank you. I'm trying to keep too much in my head. Uh, not like the creative industry uh, analysis that Richard Florida has done, um, but uh, by discipline within the arts. He's trying to understand what is the, what is the contributions of the fine arts, the performing arts, uh, other arts disciplines, media arts. Is there a correlation between those specific industries and gentrification of neighborhoods and displacement? Uh, and what he's found is that uh, we cannot take single disciplines, or all disciplines, sorry, and paint them with a broad brush. Uh, the, the correlation for the fine arts and performing arts, for example, in his study, uh, based on 30 U.S. metropolitan areas, um, is a negative correlation. There is no correlation between displacement and those disciplines, whereas there is some correlation, a positive correlation, not a big one, uh, with the media arts. Uh, so I can go into that uh, research in, in detail some other time. It's really, really interesting work. Uh, and it convinced me that after reading uh, some of Richard Florida's work, that we need a much more granular understanding of, of of what's going on in our communities and how we're contributing or not contributing to uh, to the economic and uh, urban vitality of our communities. Uh, and that's uh, essentially what convinced me to go ahead with this initiative. So that's where, that's what I've got. Uh, and uh, feel free to ask any questions. I have uh, I have countless questions. I think. Cool. I like uh, questions. Uh, I mean, I think you've done a really great job, just of like laying out the the landscape of of what this project needs to dive into, and kind of the long term outlook of the the process, which is great. You've done a ton of data work already, obviously, and a lot a lot of reading um, to get to this point where you can. Um, I think, and like you've noted, connect a lot of the. Uh, disparate threads of this issue that um, are so rarely being tied together in a cohesive story and narrative about mm -hmm. this big issue that is displacement and gentrification and what role culture plays in that. So I applaud you for, for getting that far. Um, um, we worked on a project uh, this past year in a bit with the Ontario BIA Association at looking at the the role of BIAs across the province since 1950 to now, sort of being like their 50-year benchmark. And the, the greatest issue they had as well was finding truly comparable data sets yeah. to allow us to actually evaluate different geographies on a common set of metrics. Yes. Um, so you are not underestimating the challenge of that body of work because they basically our report to the province at the end of the day was that there needed to be a phase two solely focused on developing a system for gathering data that, that can allow a proper evaluation to happen. So um, I think you're right in noting that part of that organized phase possibly um, is figuring out how one even gathers comparable data on a subject that, that municipalities either intentionally or otherwise um, 
like to um, um, they they are less willing to share clear data on issues like this than one might think mm -hmm. because I think to a certain extent a lot of communities are afraid of the are afraid of the narrative of of where our data could tell us we're going on issues like like involuntary displacement because it's not a pretty story. No. Um, so if we, I think a lot of people that are maybe holders of data don't want to be implicated in that process. So I think we have to be cautious of how we engage people that do have data, um, that we um, allow a level of anonymity or something that, that encourages them to participate without feeling like they're being outed or something in that process. Absolutely. Um, which we found with municipalities for the Obia project, we had to sign a lot of NDA agreements and a lot of, <laughs> uh, we had to be very clear about how we were articulating the data at the end of the day so that we weren't identifying, this BIA is horrible at this and this BIA is great at this. Why are they so you know different or whatever? While still being able to identify where there's disparate outcomes with the same tools or something of that sort. But um, I guess the, the biggest question, I mean, you've identified so many great funding sources. You noted Shirk at the end sort of funding some other projects. I would see this as something that Shirk would, at the right point, be interested in, one would think. Yep. Um, um, if, from a Hamilton perspective, I love that we're, we're being included in that sort of top line uh, number of cities. I was literally at a theater um, experience over the weekend that was led by a group of Toronto artists who have moved here, but it's, the whole notion was exploring why, why are they here. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting to see a work, a piece of work about displacement um, and their arrival in a community. So it's um, it is ever present here right now, and it's on the tip of the tongue of uh, many artists, young and old, right now to understand what that new relationship is. Um, and it's, but it's something that's been coming for a decade. We've seen it as a studio provider, that those calls coming in for a decade. So it's neat to see that it's now something that people want to actually dig into um, in one way or another. Um, and, and however we can be a support, whether that's a space, uh, hosting events, um, helping, reaching out. Um, we're, we're, I would say, experts at running surveys that engage artists. Um, so happy to dive into that world. And we've done that in a number of other cities. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I, I guess um, I guess the biggest questions uh, would and we'll answer it in time, no doubt. Like, what does that three-year budget include, uh, and all of that, so that we can get a sense around. It's a large project, you know, heading into the multiple millions. So, understanding yeah. what that looks like over time, but that's not something that needs to be addressed at this moment. But very excited about where you're headed. So, thank you. Yeah, um, the in the multi-year, I have something like uh, with the multiple with the, the with the matching fund something like seven hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars per year that is not allocated to anything specific. I I call it intervention space. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> and I have no idea what that's going to be explicitly, but it's meant to be on the ground funding to invest in buildings or develop economic training uh, sources or develop new, I don't know, commission artwork that responds and, and tells the story of uh, gentrification sure. and displacement, uh, right. helping do political advocacy work, uh, uh, more studies. I, I don't know uh, what that will be, but I'm ho I, I think like when I start thinking $750,000, it's not going to go very far. <laughs> Uh, yeah. per year when yeah. we start looking at this issue of, of space and housing. So it could be uh, significantly more if we get the funding. But uh, yeah. in terms of uh, the actual budget, uh, I'm hold only holding back about 20% to, uh, to pay to keep the lights on and so on. Uh, yeah. And 80% is going to go uh, to programming in the space. Uh, in our community. I, I think uh, from our own point of view, I'm interested, I'm still interested in the, in the issue of charitable venture platforms and yeah. trying to find a, a way, a, a legal and a community engaged way to make these platforms happen. Because uh, I think it's a potential economic solution to this. Uh, is to d help diversify the the income potential of artists in our communities so that they're not reliant on public funding. Uh, and so uh, Arts Pond, if we ever become a charitable venture platform, may be able to uh, deliver some of the solutions to this. 
Um, but uh, you know that's not our focus as the as the uh, you know the proposed backbone for this. We're uh, our role uh, for this effort is is meant to be uh, facilitating uh, dialogue and communication and shared knowledge and all of this. But uh, our our own uh, efforts may help provide some solutions. So I I don't know. Uh, where that's going to go, but my assumptions are uh, for the first few years, we're going to be doing a lot of research and developing the information systems uh, to capture that research. I, I love that you've got some funding that is, uh, or, or uh, budget, budget room that's yet to be allocated that's meant to be <laughs> responsive. Money, right? like we, we talk about that so much with, with a lot of our communities that we work with that so often budgets get, you know, whittled right down to we're spending $5 on this kind of paper and there's nothing left at the end of the day when we hear, especially a process like this where maybe, maybe we hear a voluminous response around a certain kind of reaction that this process could be having and yet we've not budgeted to be able to, to enact that response. So I think that's great that you're remaining open to that about what that response could be from the project and that it could be everything from public art to buildings to advocacy work to whatever it might well be. Um, oh, I think it's great. I think it's great that you keep that open, um, and and we explore what that what that is at the end of the day. So that that's great, and and I think twenty percent is is the minimum you should be holding back to be the administrative backbone and whatnot yeah. of all of this. It's going to become all consuming at some point. So yeah, <laughs> um, I think that's the you know that's the baseline of where you should be starting as far as the the core organization behind the behind the bigger project. So. Uh, so this is our budget for the stage one detailed. I hope to raise five hundred seventy-three thousand uh, dollars. We're not eligible. Uh, Arts Ponds not eligible to apply to Canada Council and many of these other funders uh, until next year. Next year. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we have a fiduciary secretariat, which is currently Rosemary Theatre, that's uh, helping uh, as a lead applicant to these funders, uh, and then there's ones that we're eligible to. Uh, so you know, we're, uh, there's staff, uh, there's expenses for uh, project managers, project coordinators, project assistants, the data scientist, which you know, thirty nine thousand. It's not full time. That's like not yeah. even half time at a sort of seventy dollar an hour minimum wage uh, for a data yeah. scientist. Um, but you know, it's a start, uh, yeah. and uh, we have some money for the lead researcher, which may be more than one person, the research assistants. Uh, lived experience, uh, honorarium for the yeah. citizen advisory committee, uh, for the focus groups, uh, for the public roundtables, the hosting expenses for those, the market research surveys, uh, the mini symposium and public roundtable hosting expenses. Uh, we have, I don't have a lot of money. It's the hardest thing I can uh, get in the budget right now is honoraria for the leadership committee. I do have money for the hosting uh, expenses and up here I do have you know twenty eight thousand dollars for uh, leadership committee honoraria, but given the amount of work that's involved and the number of people at the table, that's not very much. Uh, it's the hardest part of the budget that I can yeah. um, uh, convince the funders to fund because it's not determined uh, what each of each uh, partner's contribution is at this moment. Uh, but I do want to make sure that everyone at least gets an honoraria, whether it's, I don't know, some people don't want it because they're fine, they don't need it, so more uh, uh, people can get more, but I'm hoping it can be at least $750 each uh, times, you know, so many people. Uh, and some might get a couple thousand dollars if some people decline because they have annual operating and they feel like they're, they're, it's part of their annual work and they don't need a fee. Uh, we have money for uh, buying research resources, for a publicist, communications coordinator, marketing and production dissemination, for translation, English to French, and French to English is really important to me for this initiative to be inclusive. Uh, so I've got more on the translation side than the interpretation for the symposiums, but there's some money there, uh, and then administration and so on. Great. And then I can see as a one last thing, I can show you that I, I have a 10-year budget that I have been working on. Uh, so, um, so this is a $3.8 3 million, $3 million budget, which is essentially just Trillium and some of the Canada Council uh, requests. And I think it could be much more if Canadian Heritage really dives in and we get some other foundations. 
I think the potential for fundraising here from corporations and foundations, once it's especially up and running, is almost endless. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but I'm hoping that, uh, as a minimum, we can raise uh, 3.8 or $4 million um, over time. And this is the... So I've got down here uh, on the second page... Public, yeah, I've just got a public intervention expenses out of three three point four million is one point two million. Wow, that's wonderful. So it's not very much. It's like five uh, uh, five thousand in this in this year, and then nineteen or twenty thousand a year for stage two, and then essentially two hundred and twenty five thousand uh, or so, two hundred fifty thousand per year for the five years after that. As a minimum, and that's uh, no, it's, I haven't specified what that is explicitly. Right. Yeah. And then the rest is around uh, you know, translation and audit and marketing, and uh, we have a we'll have full time researchers, full time data analysts, uh, full time IT developers, uh, participant honoraria, leadership committee honoraria, and so on. So uh, all the people get paid for their time. Yeah. So that's it. Thanks for attending this session, and I look forward to sharing more updates on this project as it develops in the coming months. If you have any questions, you can reach me, Jessa Aguilo, at hello at artspond.com. Thanks, everybody, and see you soon.